So in the previous video, we analyzed a malicious word document and from that analysis, we identified that it was trying to download a malicious file called 267.exe. So since that video, I have put my virtual machine into NAT mode. So it has a internet connection. I connected to my VPN to hide my IP address and I downloaded that malware sample. Now on my screen, I have the sample here and I am now back in host only mode. So my machine, my virtual machine does not have any internet connectivity and I can safely begin to analyze this malware. Now what we're going to start with is some basic static analysis and see what indicators and what information we can pull from this file. So first of all, let's just drop it into HXD and just confirm that we are looking at an executable. And as we touched on before with headers, this is the header of the file here. And for an executable, it always begins with the hex values of 4D, 5A. And the ASCII conversion on the right hand side we can see is MZ. So along with the string here saying this program cannot be running DOS mode, I'm happy now that I am looking at a Windows executable and I can begin my analysis. So let's drag that into P Studio and let's just see what information we can pull out here. So on the first window that we have, we can see that we have some hashes. So we have an MD5 hash, a SHA1 and a SHA256. Now we could copy these like we've done before and put these in virus total. And that should just tell us hopefully what antivirus vendors will be detecting this, what malware family it may belong to, and if there's any community comments that may be of interest, we could have a read of those. Um, as we scroll down, we have the first bytes in hex, which we've just used HXD for. So again, we can see in the header 4D5A in the MZ string, we have the size of the file, and we have the entropy of the file, which is interesting because it will help to tell us if the malware is packed or not. So packed malware, what that means is basically is when a malware author creates a piece of malware, what they will do is they'll essentially put like a wrapper, an extra layer of code around the malware so that to stop us as malware analysts identifying what the true functionality of the malware is. And what this will do is it will hide things like IP addresses, domains that the malware might call out to you know, useful IOCs that us as malware analysts and security analysts can use to detect the malware, block the malware. So obviously the malware authors want to stop that. So coming back to entropy, basically what happens when the file is packed, it's, in, it's compressed and encrypted, which generates high levels of randomness in the file. Now, the randomness is measured using entropy. So the lowest level of the scale being zero, the highest level of this uh, scale being eight. And we can see on this one I've highlighted here that it is detected the entropy as 5.983, which is just below six. So quite a high level of entropy there, which makes me think the malware is packed. Next, we have the imp hash, which I will come back to uh, on that. We have the signature, so it's detecting that the file was written in C++. We have the file type. The architecture of the file, so if it's 32-bit or 62-bit, and we have the timestamp of when the malware was compiled. Now, these can be um, forged, um, so again, it's just something to be aware of. Next, we have the indicators. Now, there's not a great deal in here, to be honest, that's uh, of interest. However, there is this um, section here which says the file references a debug file path. Now. You can see here at the end, we have this uh, file name.pdb. Now, PDB is a program database file. It's often referred to as a symbol file. Now, this is generated upon compilation of the file to, distort, to store debugging information about an individual build of a program. So this has been left in there. And we can see here, we've got the original file name. So again, just something, if we're looking at multiple samples and we come across the file name, we know it, you know, it's the same type of malware. Uh, next, I'll look at sections, and we can see here we've got the .txt section of the malware, our data, all the way through to .rsrc. Now, again, you don't really need to be too familiar with the different section types, um, but just note that each one we can see here 
uh, has been md 5 so let's say we're looking at um, different pieces of malware and maybe the hash of the malware is the same but we could maybe attribute them to the same malware family due to the fact that some of the sections have the same uh, md5 hashes we also have the uh, file ratios and the file size in uh, bytes as well and as we look at the text section here we can see the size of this file is significantly larger than the dot data section that maybe makes me think that the unpacked code is perhaps being stored in the dot text section and when the malware is run and it unpacks itself, it will uh, unpack the unpack code into the dot data, dot, dot data section perhaps. Next, we have the imports. Now this is known as the import address table and it's important to know about this if you want to become a malware analyst. So basically when a malware author writes a piece of malware they're going to write that code you know they're writing that malicious code which is the malware itself but let's say for example they're writing the malware and when they're doing this they want some sort of functionality that could perhaps create a file now rather than having to write a function that's going to create the file let's say it's going to drop some I know another malicious file on disk what they can do is they can import this create file a function here and this is done by loading dlls which are dynamic link libraries and on the right hand side here we can see the various libraries that are being loaded and we have kernel 32.dll now create file a is part of this dynam dynamic linked library and what the malware author can do is import kernel 32.dll and then call this function create file a and use that legitimate legitimately within the malware so if i just have a look through these here we also have one such as is debugger present again it's part of kernel 32.dll so the malware author may be using this to detect if the malware is being run in a debugger and again this is like an anti-analysis technique that we'll touch on in later videos so like i say it's just important to be aware that the malware will import legitimate Windows functionality and it'll do that by way of these DLL files. And as we go down, we can also see strings. So sometimes in here, uh, you can pull out useful, interesting IOCs. Now again, if we unpack this malware and then loaded this into PStudio, the unpack sample, we may see, you know, useful information such as IP addresses and domains. But because this is packed, you know, we might not see too much of interest. So again, these here, this could be obfuscated code, you know, it's being hidden from us as malware analysts. But again, if we look, we can see this PDB path again and the original file name. So, you know, not too much of interest, you know, again, we can see Windows API functions, but again, it's just aware, just to raise awareness really that by looking at the strings, you can sometimes pull out useful information. If I just go back to the uh, main section here in P Studio as well, when I talked about the uh, import address table as well, I mentioned the imp hash earlier. Now this hash here is a hash of the import address table. So let's say you look at various pieces of malware, again, they may have different hashes, but again, you may be able to attribute it to the same family because the same import address table is being used, it has the same imp hash. So that covers pulling out some, you know, information indicators from using P Studio. But what we can also do is we could also load this executable into our Remnux distro and we can use there's a couple of other tools we can use there, which again they'll provide similar functionality and may give us a bit of extra information that we can use. So I'm just going to open up my Remnux distro. I will just make sure SSHD is running so I can do the file transfer and I just need the IP address of this virtual machine. If I go back to my Windows 7 machine and again we've done this before with the Word document load up WinSCP and we need to select SCP the IP address of the machine that we are transferring it to. So mine's dot one two eight. The username is Remnux and the password is malware. 
click yes on that that should authenticate and again I can just drag my malware across from the desktop into the uh, Remnux section and you can see there that file has been transferred across and if I just make my window a bit bigger here hit control L to clear my screen if I just hit LS we can see there that it's 267 has been copied across so couple of tools we can use here so I mentioned we looked at strings before using P Studio we can do the same again in uh, Remnux using this PSTR command and then the name of the file and let's just pack that out to less and again if I hit enter on that we can see at the top the section data and you can just tab through until you get uh, any strings of interest that you might want to record um, but from checking that you know there wasn't too much of interest that we pulled out there's those obfuscated strings that we've mentioned before again we've got some windows api functionality and there's the pdb path so again just another tool something to be aware of um, again you could also just use the command strings and again that would give you the same uh, similar output what i do want to show you though is a tool called pe frame which i think is excellent um, so again it's just pe frame the name of the file you want to analyze and I was just packed it out to less so I can press space bar and tab through the output. So that should appear on my screen now. And we can see here the information that's been outputted. We have the file name, file size. Again, we mentioned before the compile time, so we know when the malware was compiled. The amount of sections the malware has. Again, simple stuff like the hashes, which you know, you'll need to record and check. Again, we've discussed before the imp hash, so again, that's really useful to have. And again, I mentioned about pack malware, it's detecting this as uh, packed. And if we just look down here, we can actually see it's actually trying to detect the type of packer. And again, it's written in C++. So again, you'll see different ones here, and that may affect how you go about analyzing or maybe unpacking the malware. Uh, and I mentioned, you know, APIs to look out for. These can give you ideas of how the malware is going to behave. And this has pulled out some Windows API functionality that may be used as anti-debugging techniques when we begin to debug the malware. And again, it's just ones like, is debugger present that will stand out to you and start jumping out to you as a malware analyst. It's also pulled out some suspicious APIs, which is deemed suspicious. So again, I mentioned before, create file, um, get command line A, is debugger present, load library, read files. So again, these may be things that when we come to use a tool such as X32 debug, these might be things we want to break point on this malware. And again, these are things that I'll demo and show in later videos. It's identified a suspicious section and it's pulled out some file names as well. Again, so these aren't the PDB paths and it's obviously pulled out some DLLs and strings like that. So again, just quick, easy analysis static analysis of how to pull out uh, some information on the file which may potentially lead your analysis when we begin to do some perhaps some behavior analysis which we'll cover in the next video and then later on when we come to unpack this malware and analyze it in a debugger so that's the end of this video in the next one we are going to be doing some behavior analysis on this executable so join me for that